so that i can uh, use this uh, on our social media handles for the company yeah sure go ahead no problem there could be some questions popping up on the chat box so those you can uh, uh, i don't know or you can either unmute people and then let them ask directly or uh, some may want to put it on the chat box for you to ask sure on, sure. on their on their behalf sure definitely sir so mm. uh, what we can do is that everyone uh, thank you for being on the call uh, you can raise your hands uh, and uh, then i can unmute you or otherwise you can put it uh, put your question on the chat box and i can ask sir hmm so we have joined we have sanchit and albin also on the call sir they have also joined yeah i can see sanchit i can see his picture yeah and albin i'm guess yeah okay good so we can begin sir uh, it's already yeah fixed. let's do that perfect yeah. great uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, sir for us uh, it's a privilege to host you again uh, virtually this time uh, since we have not been able to see you since long now uh, in person uh, just to give a, a brief about uh, mr chand uh, i can uh, tell about uh, uh, sir's background so sir is a graduate of iit kanpur and i am bangalore and he has served uh, itc for 35.5 years almost uh, starting in april 1980 uh, as a bd executive uh, if i'm not wrong and uh, then sir retired as uh, the itc's uh, um, ceo for the paper division which uh, all of us uh, most uh, vividly know as classmate classmate uh, more about sir sir is an active uh, and uh, active angel investor and he's passionate about uh, mentoring entrepreneurs Uh, he's a senior advisor at Velcro, and he's also part of uh, Kerisu Chennai uh, forum. Um, as far as I remember, sir, I think we have been associated with you for almost more than four years now. Uh, we reached you on mail, and then uh, you have actively been helping us um, with uh, uh, your mentorship and guidance. And we have been fortunate to have uh, uh, have been one of your portfolio companies as well. We have invested. so uh, thank you for coming uh, to the live show sir my pleasure thank you for having me thanks a lot sir so i will just begin with uh, some question and answers uh, sir um, from a few questions from my end first uh, so sure. i'm i'm just curious to know that uh, how has been your routine uh, nowadays uh, in lockdown and uh, as a leader which we see you uh, i think it would be great learning for all of us as entrepreneurs and employees Uh, in this forum sir i think it's very important in this period to keep your energy levels up energy and optimism that comes with that energy so uh, the key thing is to do some physical exercises which i try and do so i go up to my terrace and do a brisk morning walk and i follow it up with a yoga routine with some cardio included so that's about an hour hour and 15 minutes in the morning every morning and after that uh, you also have to build your mental stamina now you can do that in many ways uh, i choose to uh, you know sometimes do the crossword or play board games like scrabble and upwards and things like that so i do that almost every day uh, do a bit of reading and uh, for relaxation there's always netflix prime and other ott channels which uh, i <laughs> i'm catching up on with some reading during the day i do a lot of calls with my mentees with my investees with my coaches and some of the family businesses whom i am also advising and uh, you know this is a period where you need to be in more close communication and uh, in a sense help be a sounding board to all of them and that's what i do so it's about 3 4 5 calls in a day at least so really that's what i do it's quite busy and uh, just trying to help uh, you know everybody 
look forward with some sense of positivity sure sir are you also involved into house uh, chores like cooking and uh, cleaning utensils anything uh so i you know fortunately we have a live in servant who lives with us okay uh, so i don't have to do cooking but what i do is i do the ironing so i'm pretty good at steam ironing okay nice yeah yeah nice. great so uh, one thing i was uh, reading about alibaba was uh, that how uh, jack ma turned the company uh, during the times of sars in 2001 and 2003 um so i just wanted to check with you that have you experienced something very similar uh, during your itc days and if uh, uh, yes then how would have you tackled it like definitely not a pandemic but uh, an epidemic or any other natural uh, disaster which would have come to you during your itc days uh well we had some man made disasters in itc we had a period where uh, you know we had a major industrial relations problem in one of our units in chennai this is when i was in the paper and packaging business and uh, i remember at that time because uh, we had to shut the factory for almost uh, what it was more than a month or so so we managed to actually arrange supplies with other from other packaging companies and uh, you know i i was kind of stationed in bangalore to work with one of the companies there we also got some supplies from singapore and so contingency plans uh, you know to manage and maintain business continuity for your customers is very important so that that's a big lesson that uh, how do we maintain business continuity now in this case uh, of covid uh, the problem is that even the customer is locked out right Correct. so then uh, you know it, it 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 becomes a level playing field for everybody but uh, i must say that even now uh, certain essential services are running so for example if you are in healthcare or if you are in uh, food supplies and things like that you are running and if you are running then your support uh you know uh, vendors and all also have to run so i know that itc is running its atta and uh, biscuit factories as well as its personal care factory making savlon soap sanitizers and so on and uh, so the packaging and uh, paper that is required is also happening from two packaging factories at haridwar and chennai uh so yeah so so basically important uh, to manage business continuity at all times correct and sir are you also in touch with itc uh, in these covid times and do you have any idea of how they are coping up with uh, non essential goods and uh, their manpowers uh, uh, as well yeah uh, so non essential goods uh, of course unless they are related to the foods business or the personal care business uh, they are pretty much on a standstill particularly badly hit is the hotels business uh, right. but uh, what they are doing is a lot of volunteerism in terms of offering the hotel properties for doctors and other you know paramedics to actually come and stay there right. and they are also doing some work in terms of feeding uh, you know the daily wagers and so on so it's more of a social uh, let's say step forward from the hotels business but otherwise yeah the for business purposes they are practically shut and doesn't look like it's going to be a very good year for tourism going okay. forward yeah uh, but parts of the company are running as i just spoke about correct nice sir uh, this just an off off topic question sir um, many of uh, the people who are attending this uh, talk is also are also aspiring entrepreneurs and uh, um, i think i just wanted to check with you with your opinion on uh, are you still actively seeking angel investing and uh, um, and on a broader thing uh, how uh, if you can tell us about your experiences and learnings in this entire process of investing into entrepreneurs and how do you think from here onwards post covid um how how would it change uh okay so 
you know, this is not a very great time for fundraising. So as an angel investor, I can say that I am keeping my gunpowder dry to invest or to top up investments in my existing investees. So what we've done over the last, so for example, and this is true for all angel networks. So what we've done over the last uh, three, four weeks is to reach out to all our investees to find out, uh, you know, what are their pain points? What is their, what are their survival issues at this stage in terms of, uh, you know, what is their runaway like? Are they good for six months, eight months, 12 months? And what is it we need to do to help them scale up? So, uh, and that is where I think it's the first line of investment and the first line of, uh, yeah, of, of top up really goes to the existing set of investees. As far as new investees are concerned, I'm afraid this isn't a very good time. Uh, I think they will have to wait for at least, my guess is at least six months before they can you know, pitch and evoke investor interest at this stage. Correct. I, I think that that's uh, rightly put, sir, because uh, we have been off, off lately in touch with few uh, investors and uh, uh, new investors and VC funds. And they also mentioned that uh, right now their focus is to save their own portfolio companies and then go into uh, fresh investing. Exactly. Exactly. Right, sir. That's, uh, and that's very important because, you know, we, we, you know, the existing investee portfolio have achieved some traction and it's important that they ride this period, uh, you know, very strongly. So we are tending to back them quite a lot. Correct. Sir, Alvin has asked a question that how does a large conglomerate like ITC uh, quickly adapts uh, to the best practices for keeping their employees in factories safe during COVID, uh, especially uh, essentials, food and food product divisions? Uh, well, I can say that uh, there are very strict protocols. Uh, and I think those uh, in any case have been, the guidelines have been set by the Ministry of uh, the home ministry in India and uh, but but each company then you know translates those guidelines into actionable routines it uh, manage to be able to implement so all that is happening and of course uh, very quickly our entire personal care factory which was making deodorants and perfumes and soaps all of that has now gone into uh, savlon related products basically hygiene soaps sanitizers and now uh, disinfectants and other things are coming out so uh, you know just like lal 10 has done you guys have decided to trade in a lot of uh, covid products so itc decided to uh, you know transform all its manufacturing lines into hygiene products in its personal care factories and of course the food products uh, all continue the prop, the challenge is that a lot of them are in the you know the red zones. So only the ones which are in orange and green are able to run without hassles. The ones in the red zone very tough to get uh, goods in and out, right? Correct. So it's been a quite a tough job to go get passes, get permissions from the local administration in the factory catchment areas and so on. But it's all been done, and I must say that. Uh, uh, the food food uh, factories almost fifty to sixty percent of them of that capacity is operational right now. Correct. Uh, in fact, a lot of migrant workers working in the factories have also moved towards the villages, and uh, that has also led to uh, new age companies like Big Basket and Milk Baskets uh, turnaround time in operations to effect actually, sir. Yes. It's correct. So, uh, so one thing which uh, a lot of entrepreneurs have been discussing on our common mutual uh, groups where we have been part of is that uh, the range of products which uh, they have been doing uh, is or might be obsolete for some time. And how does the post-COVID opportunities would look like for an aspiring entrepreneur who uh, is seeking some fresh ideas? So what would you suggest? Um, yeah, so the thing is, uh, you know, this is a great time for you to reflect on your business, uh, on the category that you are engaged with, as well as your business model. And uh, to figure out that post-COVID, 
are you still going to be as relevant as you were pre covid or do you need to pivot your business uh, into the newer opportunities so for example the growth sectors going forward typically will be healthcare because healthcare is going to give a get a big bump and when i say healthcare associated with healthcare all goods and services as well right so that's going to be very clearly uh, leading the pack then there'll be other businesses like for example insurance right uh, agri businesses uh, so agri education education a lot of it is gone online and you know even when uh, the embargo is lifted part of it may still remain online and part will go back to offline but education uh, is is going to remain and in fact what tends to happen is that whenever there is such a exigency people tend to you know educate themselves and prepare themselves for uh, or let's say enhance their skills so that when they reemerge they are uh, they they enhance their cv value so i would say education is still going to be very promising uh, healthcare i spoke about agri will remain promising new services uh, like uh, insurance other financial uh, payments all kinds of you know anything to do with financial services will do well the right. problem will be in uh, you know some of the traditional sectors like automotive um, metals and commodities and things like that those are going to take some time to come out or even energy um, you know oil oil and gas and things like that but consumer essentials uh, should do okay and health and education definitely financial services definitely right so so you have been actively involved with uh, uh, social startups and startups which are helping beneficiaries which are end of the pyramid uh, people either farmers or uh, the artisanal yeah. sectors uh, one of the per per person involved with the craft sector has asked a question that how can uh, you think uh, that people can help weavers tailors embroiderers and other artisans to sustain themselves which are working in different villages across the country uh, when at this point uh, we see that the demand might not be as that great as it was earlier yeah this is a pretty tough period for such uh, you know categories of crafts persons working in uh, their own locations because i'm guessing orders have dried up whether you're a fab india or a lal ten you're not really placing orders but i do feel that uh, uh you know at least the bigger companies uh, should uh, you know step forward and maybe uh, give some of these uh, crafts clusters some sort of a you know an a, a monetary support which can later on be adjusted against uh, future bills so you know that's something that uh, the larger companies can definitely do and uh, to the extent practicable i could even suggest that to lalten at least in the critical clusters and with the critical artisans so let's say if your billing with them is 10 lakh rupees over the next 6 months uh, you could advance them that money today and uh, keep adjusting it against future bills correct you know things right. like that so because otherwise there is no other social security you know then they have to dep depend on government schemes and uh, those are uh, yeah i mean whatever government schemes are there definitely they should utilize all those uh, benefits that are flowing through but but i think uh, this is what i would say that uh, the principal buyer from these crafts people can do and maybe should do correct but sir uh, again coming back to this the principal buyers are also stuck with uh, the demand so where they can liquidate this goods so uh, wouldn't be it very risky uh, for principal buyers also to uh, to uh, get into a product range might which might not be uh, very no i'm not i'm not suggesting that you build inventory i'm suggesting that you make them an advance cash payment for against an order against future order so you give them an open order correct and you say that the details on that order will get filled as and when you get your orders but it's like an advance payment 
correct makes sense yeah so uh, another person has asked that how would you like to uh uh what would be the new retail channels if the malls and markets are shut for a long period of time yeah so what is happening here is that i think e-commerce is going to get a big boost uh you know and i know of cases where uh, even for non essentials uh, people have been ordering and the companies have been telling consumers hold on we can't deliver yet but it's just because you know people have time when they are stuck at home and uh, the so called retail therapy is now working through the e-commerce sites earlier people went to malls and you know uh, uh, <laughs> that was kind of therapeutic for them Correct. now the same same thing is happening through uh, you know just traveling through these e-commerce sites uh, and they're discovering new categories new sites new merchandise so i think it's going to be a good time for e-commerce moving forward definitely i think so there would be a tsunami uh, which would be digital led uh, with a lot of exactly. companies planning to come online exactly so there's a lot of innovation uh, possible on the e-commerce sites you can have a lot of you know you can have chatbots you can have ushers you can have whatever buddies uh, who can pop up and you know advise you or help you know play the role of a sales person on Correct. the e-commerce site uh, yep. i i i think a lot of creativity is going to move into that area sure so in fact what we can also learn is lot from uh, chinese companies and how they and south korean companies how how they have been moving post covid uh, with new innovative business models and technology yes uh, that, that's what we can replicate it in india as well so sure sure it's a good idea uh so uh, one of the persons has asked that how do you see the export market trends in india change for both goods and services post normalcy is it going well, to increase uh, or how would it be like sir? no i i see a temporary problem barring in healthcare so in healthcare what's going to happen is that everybody is going to help one another because there is a it's a kind of a commitment that everybody has towards each other's well being so anything to do with healthcare will travel very well across borders okay but the problem will be in uh, the other categories where increasingly uh, each country will try and uh, protect its own uh, you know factories manufacturing establishments uh, you know live workforce and so on so in the short term there is likely to be a push back on global trade uh, it will tend to be more local trade now you know that even in india there is an anti china sentiment developing i mean there's a global uh, sentiment but in india as well and there's a huge cry for uh, being self reliant right? right what that also does is that it gives you a little headroom to your uh, you know manufacturing infrastructure for goods as well as services to be able to uh, cater to the home market right of course uh, it services uh, which are across the border and so on will continue i don't see any big problem there although there will be some attempts uh, by some developed countries to bring a few things back on shore and purely from the point of view of risk mitigation because say for example in this period uh, a lot of the captive centers in bangalore of for fortune 500 companies you know these are captive centers a lot of them were uh, disturbed and these captive centers really uh, are meant to support us consumers right so if a us consumer dials its his uh, service uh, line in the us he gets connected to an a person sitting in india in bangalore so because of some of those disruptions i feel that uh, some of these centers may move back uh, to uh, to the host country but uh, but from a from a competitive advantage perspective it's really india philippines and a few others who uh, uh, i mean it it won't be viable for for the us for example to move 
all their captives back home that that doesn't work makes sense but so that's how that's how i see it uh, sort of playing out so in fact couple of days ago sir we were having a conversation with uh, one of our buyers in los angeles and uh, so she is basically a distributor to big buyers like hugberries there mm. so she did mention that uh, uh, there is a sudden rise in terms of home furnishing demand in us and uh, mm-hmm. demand for eco friendly products so one of the designers have uh, asked sir that what do you think uh, about the market that caters mainly to home furnishing and uh, uh, furniture which are like uh, which can be quirky and house made uh, for work from home kind of environment yeah i think uh, it's an interesting opportunity because with more work from home you want to uh, also sort of fit out your work your home a lot better than it currently is sure sir so yes i i'm, I'm sure there are there are opportunities there at and least instinctively one thinks so i mean i don't have a great deep knowledge of that market but but at least the gut feel says yes it makes sense correct so uh, so it means that uh, is with the traditional sectors which are like uh, the back end offices of us fortune 500 companies which are intending to grow for sure uh there would be a lot of other sectors uh, maybe a furniture or a home furnishing or any other sectors which can also find more opportunities uh post covid uh yes so so one of the uh, person uh, is uh, working with marriott and uh, she has asked that uh, with the expected recession post the pandemic uh what should be the way forward for uh, people in uh, tourism and travel sector well yeah that's a little tough uh, i uh, you know <laughs> i'm i'm not i'm not being facetious but it would be wonderful if the hotel could get converted to a hospital correct exactly or a quarantine centers or a quarantine center and uh, you know maybe there are there are a lot of similarities by the way between hotels and hospitals i remember you know many years ago i was based in chennai and apollo had its flagship hospital there and next to that hospital there was a hotel called sinduri and uh, in a year or two that uh, hotel was transformed into an extension of the hospital and uh, today it's a seamless uh, thing you know so both buildings are connected through a through a common uh, you know uh, a tunnel kind of thing and uh, they both serve as as hotels but but this is radical thinking i think uh, uh it's going to be it's going to be a slow comeback for uh, travel and tourism right i think there has to be something very innovatively done uh, with technology or so that the employees which are with the travel and tourism sector uh, can sustain themselves on a longer run yeah so uh i would just uh, have a couple of more questions sir uh, and then we can sure. end this call as well so uh, what do you think would be the impact on economy for smes and uh, and what should they focus on from here onwards uh, i think this has been majorly been asked by a lot of people as well yeah so it's a tough situation right now and we are all waiting for uh, you know the government of india to announce a program uh for uh, msmes which is uh, i would say on the cards but uh, each msme has to first survive and ensure that uh, you know they don't run out of cash at least for the next 6 months so this is an era of what is called scenario planning so the best case scenario is 3 months but the more practical way of looking at it would be about 6 months so can you survive 6 months so yes uh, there are cost uh, you got to manage your costs you got to take uh, salary cuts you've got to cut expenses defer all your rentals your interest payments your tax payments any kinds of liabilities all of that so may ma- make sure that uh, cash is king and cash is available at least for a minimum of 3 months but ideally 6 months and pray like mad that the package from the central government gets right. announced it ought to happen in the coming week right i think globally a lot of countries have done that except india i think 
the problem yeah. over here i think that's be, right yeah uh, so you have been also actively uh, associated with uh, uh, investing in some us based companies i think i think once you mentioned that so so how are Sorry, i i i missed that question you you just faded for a minute can you repeat yeah so you just mentioned once that you were also invest you had also invested in some us based companies uh, and uh, so if you have been in touch with them are they thinking on the same lines as what indian startups are thinking or uh, is it something very different what they are up to oh very similar except that you know they are um, in a in a more developed market and the investments have tended to be in technology or in uh you know let's say medical devices that's where it is so it's it's uh so those are two sectors which are comparatively less affected right and in fact medical devices there are new opportunities now uh because if somebody is doing a device for a particular end use uh, you can always uh, with some um, modifications create a covid related solution also for that device and i know of several cases uh, there as well as here where such things are happening as we speak so so yes uh, the challenges are similar but uh, the sectors are less challenged i would say correct correct right so uh, one thing uh, which one of the people has asked uh, what person has asked us is that itc had a great model of each opal uh, which they started in early 90s and has been uh, carried on across different districts across the country um i think uh, uh, what he has also asked is that and it would be very great as i am thinking right now is that if there would be a lobby of people like you uh, people like you lobbying to big corporates to create some innovative solutions like each opal for young smes and startups uh, and uh, i think that would help in backlinking the supply chain with the people like artisans or the farmers uh, and companies like us to fulfill them to front end buyers in urban cities so would you think that uh, that is that something which can be possible uh, with people like you uh, who have been leaders of big corporates i'm sure it's possible and uh, you know some of it is happening now what i would uh, like to say is that in all the newer businesses of itc whether it is foods personal care uh, paper products uh, matches agarbatti all of that the level of outsourcing is very high 80% of the product from these newer businesses is outsourced and inevitably from small and medium enterprises you know when i was running the uh, itc classmate business you will be astonished to know that we didn't make a single thing ourselves it was 100% outsourced we had about 40 SME partners all over India who were actually making products for us in our brand and some of them we actually developed green field in the sites that uh, you know were making sense to us close to raw material or close to market and things like that so i would say that uh, you know large companies have a tremendous ability to build a huge supply chain based on primarily on SME players and i i have personal experience of having done that right uh coming to each opal i think each opal has become even more relevant today because uh you know in a situation where there are uh challenges for the normal mandi operations and so on uh permissions are now uh, available across all states uh to private players to buy directly from farmers so initially when i remember when we got into this model we had to get a lot of permissions to be able to make it work but now the permissions are available on a platter and therefore uh, companies like itc and other food companies are now able to buy directly and uh, what that does is it also helps the farmer in terms of making the process of uh, sale a little more painless so you know there's a very quick you you just drive into a chopal area or you know now the chopal sends a little pickup truck picks up the produce and payment is instantaneously done based on a rudimentary quality check and so on so yes uh, so the so the long answer to your question is that corporates can do a lot uh, in terms of work building a supply chain which 
includes uh, you know the last farmer or a small and medium enterprise and uh, i would say uh, this is uh, more and more of this is going to happen going forward i think correct but sir uh, the bridge between an sme or a startup and a big corporate like itc or marico is, is huge and uh, we definitely need more thought leaders like you uh, which can basically shorten the bridge between us reaching out to them uh, for support and eventually uh, creating a more complementing areas where we can work uh, to fulfill the demand for the urban cities so there are two other developments happening when it comes to corporates and startups so almost every corporate now is creating a kind of a special purpose vehicle to look at startups who complement them in some way or the other right so for example if i talk about itc or mahindra or godrej all of them are trend spotting those startups who are uh, who can complement their business and uh, they are conducting accelerator programs for them and if they find that there are a couple of them who are interesting they are even taking a stake in those companies uh, as a strategic investor and throwing open their institutional strengths for example their uh, sales and distribution network and things like that so that is one way of partnership where the uh, startup becomes uh, let's say aligned uh, into the corporate very directly the other thing is that a lot of csr funding is now permitted to go into incubators uh you know earlier there were certain restrictions on this 2% csr where it could go and where it couldn't it's now uh incubators uh, are eligible for csr uh funding as well so what companies are doing is that some of their csr funding is coming into incubators to help uh, again uh hand picked startups to uh, so what that so i know for example i work very closely with the iit kanpur incubator and uh, so banks like standard chartered and hdfc bank part of their csr money has come into that incubator and they take a look at all the incubators and say okay here are the guys i would like uh, the money to go to and these are some of the programs we would like to fund through you so 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 these are two examples of how a corporate uh, can also work with the uh, the startup ecosystem beyond what i said uh, about the uh, you know the customer supplier relationship correct thanks a lot for this sir i think that has been very insightful i would just want to end uh, uh, this uh, talk with a very interesting question from one of our uh, viewers here so she has asked her name is akansha she has asked she has asked that uh, what do you think will change for good after covid after covid wow <laughs> ah what will change for good i think uh, and i hope uh, that uh, you know there will be a greater balance between uh, uh, you know uh, mankind and the environment sure uh, i i certainly hope that happens and i also feel that uh, there has been a lot of bonding uh, during this period uh, you know several whatsapp groups so they could be family groups they could be resident groups uh, you know they could be common interest groups i feel a lot of this bonding uh, will uh, will also stay post covid it will bring people closer and there'll be a lot more uh, gratitude and a feeling of uh, mutual give and take right so these are some of the things definitely thanks a lot sir now we are trying to empathize more with the nature and with uh, the people around us as well exactly thanks a lot for this uh, uh, call sir and thank you for giving us time uh, it has been a pleasure to talk to you uh, virtually uh, after seeing you in person after so long thank you thank you it, it was very nice of you to have me and all the best yes sir thank you thanks a lot bye yes bye